There's a solitary, humble, wooden structure on a windswept hill in rural New England. To open the door is to engage our minds, our hearts, and our imaginations. In this place, preachers and professors, past and present, come alive as they walk the aisle, ascend the pulpit stairs, and teach. From theology, from history, and from the Word of God, welcome to the Saybrook Meeting House, an audio production of Saybrook Ministries. We read for our scripture lesson the third chapter of the Gospel according to John. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born of you. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know whence it comes or whither it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can this be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand this? Truly, truly I say to you, we speak of what we know, and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, and whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does what is true comes to the light, that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been wrought in God. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the land of Judea. There he remained with them and baptized. John also was baptizing at Eden near Salem, because there was much water there, and people came and were baptized. For John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between John's disciples and a Jew over purifying. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan... To whom you bore witness, here he is baptizing, and all are gone to him. John answered, No one can receive anything except what is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now full. He must increase, but I 
must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth, and of the earth he speaks. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. He who receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God. For it is not by measure that he gives the Spirit. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God rests upon him. May God bless to our understanding this portion of his word. In this brief series of messages, we preach first on the Christian doctrine of hell, indicating that the Bible, and especially our Lord Jesus Christ, teaches not only plainly but repeatedly and most emphatically and solemnly that all the impenitent wicked at the moment of death shall come into judgment, which judgment shall ultimately be in both body and soul, in varying degrees, but in a perfect intensity of anguish and suffering, without alleviation, and without ever coming to an end. Last evening we considered the question, who is in danger of this judgment? And we indicated in that message that not only are open, vicious, and gross sinners, not only are thieves and murderers and harlots certain to perish in perdition. But far more significant for us, no one of us being, I'm sure, a gross offender in such a category as that, is the solemn warning of our Lord Jesus that many who call him Lord and profess to be his disciples and indeed have assurance of their salvation and may even have given all their goods to feed the poor, and may even have laid down their lives in testimony to the truth, and may even be preachers of his gospel and the instruments of the salvation of other persons, may nevertheless have no work of grace in their soul, stand in imminent danger of eternal damnation. Tonight, as we conclude this series, we deal with the question, how to escape. I should like to say this at the beginning. This is something of repetition, a review. I'm sure all of you know this. Nevertheless, I want to make this point at the outset. The scriptures teach us plainly that there is a hell. It warns us very solemnly and deliberately about it. It wants us to know the future destiny. It doesn't leave us in ignorance on this important matter. It very deliberately labors the point and is filled with solemn threats and admonition about the danger which is awaiting the impenitent every moment they draw breath. John the Baptist we know of especially as a great awakening preacher of righteousness. One of his remarks which he made to some people who came, who seemed to him to be hypocritical in their profession of conversion, tells us a good deal about the accent in his preaching, as he turned to these Pharisees and said, who has warned you to flee from the wrath which is to come? That was not only an insinuation that they were not coming to him for any true motive, but it was also an incidental intimation that he was calling upon people truly and sincerely to flee from the wrath which is to come. He preached eternal damnation, and he was calling people to repentance, and when they came to profess their faith and to acknowledge their repentance and to receive his baptism, he regarded them, among other things, as fleeing from the wrath which is to come. But as we said on Sabbath evening, our Lord Jesus, more than John the Baptist or more than any other preacher, in the sacred word, did dwell upon this theme of endless punishment in the world to come, and did warn men who heard him to flee from the wrath which is to come. He was a very solemn preacher of the last judgment. 
Some of you who weren't here, will pray. those of you who are, were here will permit me to repeat for the benefit of some who weren't here, and what has personally convinced me as a preacher of the gospel of the serious importance of constant preaching on this theme, not exclusive, but constant preaching on this theme is a deliberate, was a deliberate and slow reading of the gospel of Matthew, in which I had it burned into my consciousness that the Lord Jesus Christ had this subject on his lips almost constantly. But Christ was certainly a preacher of this, and so was the Apostle Paul. When he says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And when we think of him before those learned infidels at Athens, after he had declared some sort of philosophic wisdom, and then went on to introduce them to Jesus Christ, and mentioned the resurrection, in that very context he told them that this man who was resurrected, this Jesus Christ, was going to be the judge of the world. And in Acts 17, 1, you get one of the greatest statements about the coming judgment that there is from the lips of the Apostle Paul. The whole Bible, in other words, is preoccupied with this theme and its preachers are typical in expressing it. We have no more vivid pictorial representation of it than in the Old Testament incident of the curses and the blessings given from Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. You will remember the Israelites were commanded to assemble between these two mountains. And from Mount Ebal, the priests who were appointed uttered a long stream of curses which would come upon persons who did such and such. Whereas on the other Mount Gerizim, another group of priests uttered certain blessings, a long list of them, which would come upon those who did such and such. But in a certain sense, dear friends, this world in which we now live is very much like that valley between the two mountains, Evil and Gerizim. Temporarily we are here, and on one side of us the curses are coming from Mount Evil or the pit, a solemn warning of what shall come upon us if we do so and so. And on the other hand, from the other mountain, Gerizim from heaven, all the blessings are enunciated and promised if we do such and such. But we are temporarily here in the moment of crisis, in the valley of decision, in the place where our ultimate destiny is determined, whether we will receive the, ver the curses which come from evil or the blessings which come from Gerizim is determined by us now, here, and it may very well be, in a particular instance, this very evening, for some, maybe all, no one knows what the next moment holds. We're in the valley now, but we shall eternally be in the mountain of blessing or the mountain of cursing, one or the other. All right, the Bible teaches that. It tells us that. It wants us to realize our situation and to realize it very plainly. But now I want to ask this question. Why does the Bible thus terrify us with the doctrine of this dreadful, impending judgment if we remain impenitent and unbelieving and unreformed? What's the purpose of scaring us? Certainly, no one in his right mind can possibly for a moment think of hell and not be scared stiff. Only an idiot could think about the mere possibility of such a thing and not be frightened. If you could be afraid of catching a disease or having a heart attack or suffering from cancer, and we would look upon somebody who could consider deliberately contracting one of these diseases for no purposes whatever. We would say the man was demented. Well, if anybody could ever contemplate eternal misery without being frightened at the prospect of it, he couldn't possibly be a rational individual. This doctrine is calculated to terrify. It can't possibly do anything else. God knows that. If we even we realize it, God certainly knew it when he ordained this doctrine to be preached by his ministers. 
Now the question is, why is he frightening us? What is the purpose of it? Some people think that hell is meant to scare us into heaven. That you can actually be terrified into conversion. That you can be so frightened that your heart is changed or altered. And all I have to do is state that fact for the absurdity of it to be evident to everyone. If a man is wicked, if you tell him he's going to be cast into flames forever, that isn't going to make him righteous. How can any amount of threatening possibly change a corrupt soul? Yes, it will terrify him. Of course, he'll be scared stiff. But what change will that make in him? If actually you could affect a new birth, an alteration in a person, by simply terrifying him, the devils would have become angels long ago. They have known the full visitation of divine wrath, that about which we merely speak. They know, and they've known it for a long time. And although we don't know exactly what it is, but there is something coming, even with respect to the devils, which terrifies them yet more. It's something connected with the final judgment. I don't know exactly what it, the scripture means by it, but there is something yet impending for the devils, which terrifies them even more than they're frightened now. It's indicating the New Testament when they cry out to Jesus, Hast thou come to torment us before our time? There's going to be an augmentation or increase of their torment connected with the final judgment. But they're scared. They're scared now with all their agony. They're frightened for an increase of it which is yet to come. And yet, they're devils. They've never had a holy thought. They've never had the slightest compunctions of conscience. They've never had the slightest tendency to turn from their sins. They're not a bit better now than they were when first they fell in their awful rebellion against God. If sheer terror could change a person, I repeat, the devils would have become angels long ago. No, dear friends, it's a very gross mistake to suppose that Almighty God is frightening us with the sheer fact of a coming judgment because he intends thereby to make angels out of us, to convert us out of sheer fear. It can't be done. If our hearts are evil, the threat of judgment will make us more evil. If we're blaspheming against heaven now, to be told that heaven is going to plunge us into eternal torment will make us blaspheme all the more. No, hell never, ever converted any soul. God knows that, and he never intended to use it as an instrument of conversion. But he does declare it to us. He does command his ministers to proclaim it to the people. Now the question is, why? Well, this is why. What do you do when you're frightened? What do you do when something is dangerous and imminent? in your life. If somebody brings you some news that at such and such a time some very dread event is going to take place, what do you do as rational people? Well, you sit down and say, how can I possibly avoid it? Naturally, that's what you say. And they say you'd be out of your mind if you did it. But even with some ordinary earthly disaster, if you're forewarned about it, the very first thing you're going to say is, how can I possibly avoid it? Well, if you're told about an eternal disaster, hell, naturally you say to yourself, how can I avoid it? What can I do to escape it? What's the way by which I can be delivered from this awful, impending judgment? You're naturally a cry out, what must I do to be saved? How can I be delivered? Well, that's precisely the response you're expected to make. That's exactly what God wants you to do. He tells you this so you would do just that. And you would ask precisely the question. And you would say, what must I do to be saved? How could you possibly believe in this judgment and not ask the question? You will, of course, ask the question if, as I say, you're rational. And if you don't ask the question, you're not rational. 
All right, so you ask the question, what must I do to be saved? How may I be delivered from this awful judgment and, on the other hand, be brought on my way to everlasting blessedness as wonderful in its glory as hell is dreadful in its menace? What must I do to be saved? Well, now, I think most of you would likely say at this particular point, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And that is, of course, exactly the right answer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But this is the problem that most people don't begin to realize. The Bible teaches us that mankind in its present fallen condition has no inclination whatever to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you listen to this passage of scripture which we read a moment ago? Christ says, except a man be born again, he can't even see the kingdom of God. He can't even enter the kingdom of God. It doesn't make any sense to him. This is the condemnation, he says, that the sun has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light. I'm always amused by that little tower, little light tower they have over the Pittsburgh Press Building, I think it is, in, in Pittsburgh. A light tower. And the motto of the paper being, give the people the light and they will find the way. And the notion under which most of us labor is that if once people are told the truth, they'll come running to it. The Bible doesn't represent fallen mankind in that matter at all. It says on the contrary, this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world and men love the darkness rather than the light. They don't come to the light, they flee from the light. They don't come rushing up to Christ in faith. They nail him to a cross. They don't say he is the fairest among 10,000. They say there is no comeliness in him that we should desire him. They don't follow him. They say, depart from me, thou holy one. And he himself said that's exactly the case. He that sins, says Jesus, is the bond servant of sin. He's a slave in chains. He has no ability whatever to move from his sin. He utterly hates the very message of deliverance. He can't take one solitary step toward his own redemption. His every reaction to Jesus Christ is no, 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 a thousand times no. He will have nothing to do with the Son of Man. He will break his bonds asunder, he'll cast him out, and there is only one place Jesus Christ could possibly have ended in the wicked world, and that's where he did end, on a cross. One final grand demonstration of the attitude of fallen man toward the Son of Righteousness. Here's Jesus saying that if we are ever going to believe on him, if we're ever going to enter his kingdom, if we're ever going to see any sense in his holiness, we have to be born again from above. You see the problem? You say, yes, as soon as I am confronted with what I'm missing in heaven and what I'm facing in hell, I immediately and naturally and rationally say, what must I do to be saved? And the right answer is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But the problem is, I don't want to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have the slightest desire to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't like what he stands for. He says, deny myself, and I don't want to deny myself. He tells me I've got to love God with all my heart. But the scripture says, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, and I can't even be subject to God. Is it any wonder that when people were not coming to Christ, he said it was because no man cometh unto me except the Father draw him? Unless God Almighty illumine from above, unless he break these bonds, unless he change the heart, unless he makes over again, the individual will never believe in Jesus Christ. You will not. Your neighbor will not. Your children will not. No person will ever believe in Jesus Christ. Here's your predicament. You know full well that if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, the guilt of your sin is going to sink you in the pit forever. But even though you're fully aware of that fact, that doesn't change your heart. You still don't love God. 
You still don't love beauty. You still don't love holiness. You still don't love truth. And you still don't hate yourself and you still don't hate your sin. And though you're going to perish with your iniquity, you'll die embracing it in your bosom. There's your problem. The real problem. What do you do? What can you do? How can you escape? You can do precisely nothing. There isn't a solitary person in this room who could do one solitary thing to deliver himself. Only Almighty God can deliver you. Mind you, the very God whose wrath is what threatens you is the only person who can possibly rescue you. The very God whom you hate is your only hope for your salvation. The very God who is warning you that unless you repent and turn to him, you will perish, is the only one who can give you the grace of repentance and faith. There's your predicament. The only hope you have is in your enemy, the one you hate, the one whose laws you violate, the one whose son you will not naturally accept. And yet, unless he change your heart, your heart will remain obdurate and obstinate and unbelieving, and you will perish in the midst of the most solemn and repeated warnings of the dread consequence of such unbelief. Now the question is this. If God alone is our help, and we disabuse our minds permanently of any false notion that we can do anything toward our salvation, the question still remains, is there anything we can do to enlist God's help? Is there any step we can take toward Him? Now mind you, he is our enemy because we are the violators of his law, but we're asking ourselves the question, is there anything we can do to stir his pity, to move him whose judgment is upon us to show us mercy? Is there anything we can do? Now, at that point, yes. Yes. If we do not have a believing heart, and as we are born in this world, we're born with a depraved heart, and unless we are changed from above, we do not have a believing heart. If we are in our sins at the present time and simply alerted to the danger of such a condition, no longer capable of eating, drinking, and being merry, and going on living in open defiance, as if there were no hell, as if there were no accounting, as if there were no judgment, we're past that, we're awakened from our sluggish slumbers, Whatever happens to us, we're not going to be surprised in the world to come. That is past. We're no longer ignorant. We're no longer slumbering. We're awake now, but we know full well our limitations, and we realize our desperate dependence upon our God, and we ask ourselves the question, since we don't have a believing heart, is there anything we can do while we wait and hope that God will give us what we need? Our enemy will love those who hate him. Well, the Bible indicates there are some things we can do. But the very first thing is this. We have to recognize. We have to recognize that when we even approach God, we do so as persons who are naturally obnoxious to Him. So many of us come to church as if we're doing God a favor. There are many of us who really think Almighty God is highly flattered to have us in His company. There are multitudes of people who think they are so good that when they die, God will just be waiting to welcome them into heaven. The first thing we've got to do is get rid of any such notions as that permanently. We are under the righteous wrath of God. If He leaves us to our just desert, we perish. And if, on the other hand, there's any hope, it's going to come from sheer mercy on His part. The way Christ brings this out is interesting. In his dealings with people, have you ever noticed he's virtually insulting? Here comes a woman from Syrophoenicia. She has a sick daughter. And she asks this Jew, Jesus, if he will not heal her. What does he say? In plain words, he calls her a dog. What does she say? Yes, Lord. But the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the table. I can think of a hundred people who, if Jesus had approached that way, oh, there's 
no longer interested. You can't insult me twice. You don't call me a dog. Nobody talks to me that way. Remember a woman saying after a service in Baltimore, you make me feel so big. I said to that lady, that's too big. That's too big. How big do you think that woman felt when Jesus Christ called her a dog? You think Jesus deliberately meant to insult her? Of course not. You know better about Jesus. Well, why did he do it? If she had any pride, if she had any arrogance, if she had any notion in her mind that she deserved the mercy of Jesus Christ, she would never get it. She was a sinner, and she was coming as an absolute suppliant. And Jesus Christ tested how real and how desperate her petition was. And when he insulted her, calling her what she was, a sinner, a dog, you're a sinner, you're a dog, I'm a sinner, I'm a dog, and Jesus Christ has every right to call us that and far worse than that, and if we have any false pride, we'll resent it, but if we know our own hearts, we'll acknowledge it as true, and we'll do as this woman did, and say, taking the rebuke, it's true, but Lord Jesus, give me what I need. I'm a dog, but make me a child. But if anybody is going to receive grace from Christ, he has got at the very beginning to pre be prepared to disabuse himself of any self-righteousness, to get rid of any notion that he has any claims on God. That will shut the door of the kingdom in your face immediately. Here's another thing which the Bible tells us we can do if we want to besiege the gates of divine mercy and plead with God for a love we do not deserve. It teaches us this. We must get rid of any sin of which we're capable of getting rid. Now, we can't eradicate the iniquity of our own hearts. We can't wash filth with filthy water. The Ethiopian can't change his skin, and the leopard can't change his spots, and the sinner can't change his nature. No. But there are some things we can do. Notice, for example, when John the Baptist was dealing with King Herod. Herod was an unconverted person, but he was a religious person. His heart wasn't changed, but his mind was distinctly agitated. He listened to John with fear and with joy. He had a very high respect for a true prophet of God, such as John the Baptist was. But he was not, Herod, a true convert. What did, he, what did John the Baptist say to him? Said he, you have no right to take to wife the wife of your brother. John the Baptist was telling King Herod there was no possible dealings between him and heaven until he got rid of this illegitimate wife and dissolve this illegitimate marriage. John the Baptist wasn't saying that if Herod broke off that illegitimate relationship, his heart would be changed. But what he was saying to Herod was, there was no possibility of his sincerely asking for the mercy of God while deliberately outraging the commandments of God by open and class violations thereof. If there's anyone in this company who recognizes, as indeed he ought to, that he stands in imminent danger of divine and eternal damnation, and at the same time recognizes that the obduracy of his heart is such that only God can change and cleanse him, and wants to storm the gates of heaven for mercy, you better get rid of any sin you're practicing which you can't break. If any of you are any, in, in any illegitimate relationship, are doing any illegitimate or sinful thing, if any of you young people are cheating in examinations, if any of you businessmen are corrupt in your practices, if any of you women are given or addicted to gossiping, it doesn't make any difference what the vice may be. If you're doing it right now, you are positively hypocritical and impious when you pray to God for mercy. It's in your power to stop cheating. It's in your power to stop gossiping. And without a new heart, you can be an honest businessman. And if you aren't an honest businessman, and if you aren't true in your dealings with your neighbor, and you don't write an honest examination, then don't lay any hope whatever to seeing anything of the mercy of God. The things which are in your power are required of you. When Herod refused to separate himself from this woman, he ultimately came to a crisis which made him an open enemy of God, and as you know, he was the instrument of the beheading of John the Baptist. But because he wouldn't part with the woman, he ultimately had to crucify or kill, as it were, the messenger of God. 
You'll find yourself in the same situation. But one thing is certain. If you want the mercy of God, you better examine your life and see that there is nothing in it which is an open outrage against the commandments of heaven. Now, here's another thing. A rich young ruler came to Jesus one day, you remember, and he wanted to know about eternal life. His conscience was troubled, too. Whether it was hell or whether it was something else which was disturbing him, we're not told, but something was disturbing him. And he came to ask about Jesus about eternal life. And Jesus said to this unconverted young man, Go sell all that you have. Keep the commandments. Now, Christ, mind you, didn't say that if he kept the commandments in the sense of which he could have kept the commandments, or even if he sold all that he had and came following Jesus, that he would be converted. Judas Iscariot had done that and had never been converted. But Jesus Christ was saying to an unconverted man who showed some interest in conversion, to a man who saw some interest in the kingdom of heaven, all right, we start at the beginning. We'll see whether you really are concerned. One thing is certain. If you don't at least outwardly keep the commandments, even though your heart is uncircumcised and your spirit is unchanged, if you don't outwardly keep the commandments, you certainly can't hope for a new heart. If you flagrantly violate God's holy Sabbath, if you worship idols, if you take his name in vain, if you commit theft or murder or adultery, all of which outward practices you could avoid. And if you don't avoid them, you better not expect any mercy. And furthermore, if you're really in debt earnest, and I put a test case to you, go sell all that you have, and if you're not prepared to do that, which you can do, it will hurt, yes. Naturally, parting with your fortune won't be easy. But if you're talking about eternal life and are really interested in the salvation of your soul, it'll be easy. But you remember, when that young man was faced with that crisis, his fortune was what mattered, and he gained the world and lost his soul. He went away keeping his fortune and ensured his eternal damnation. And from that day until this, we have every reason to believe in hell he has been regretting that dreadfully wrong decision. But there are things which you can do. We're also taught that unconverted people can read the Bible. Jesus said to the Pharisees, whose hearts were as malicious as any person's were, Search the Scriptures, for they bear witness of me. And let me say just one other thing that people can do who can't change their hearts, that people can do who want God to change their hearts, that people will do who are really waiting upon God for His blessing to bring them out of evil and on to Mount Gerizim. Especially attend the preaching of the Word. We're taught to search the scriptures and read the scriptures. And that Ethiopian eunuch was an instance of a man who was unconverted, but he was wisely reading Isaiah. But though he read, he wasn't converted until the expositor of the word explained what it meant. Jesus Christ, when he ascended into heaven, he gave the church gifts, and the first gift mentioned pastors and teachers. The divinely appointed way by which your conversion is to come about, the usual method God follows, the most likely source of blessing for this church and community, any church and any community, is the ordained minister of the gospel faithfully expounding the word of sacred truth. If you're not a converted person, there is no better place for you to be that in the house of God, not pretending to worship God in a hypocritical and a mocking manner, but waiting attentively upon the word as it comes and hoping and praying that God would take that heart of stone away and give you a heart of flesh. Dear friends, when we put the picture together, this is what the Bible teaches us. God is indeed going to condemn all penitent and wicked persons. And there is positively nothing they can do to change their own heart or to avoid their judgment of themselves. God alone can help them. They be born from above. The Spirit of God alone can give them a new heart. This they can do. This they must do. And if this they do, there is reason to believe that God will give them a new heart. Let them read the Word. Let them attend upon preaching. Let them pray desperately and importunately. Let them break with all known sin. 
Let them do everything which is in their power to do. And let them be humble, desperately humble, abysmally hungry, humble, giving no claim whatever to any righteousness, but prostrate before the mercy of God, pleading with him as a sinner, going up into that temple, unable to lift the eyes to heaven, but simply beat upon the breast and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then, dear friend, God may not convert you. Get the impression that you have it coming to you. Assume that because you do this and that, that he must. And you will exhaust his patience and seal your own doom. You and I have no claims upon Almighty God. We deserve the judgment which is hanging over us. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, says God. Claim mercy, demand mercy, say, God, you're a loving God, God, you're a merciful God, God, you can't do this to me, and you'll have it done to you. When a person is begging for mercy, he doesn't argue for justice. He acknowledges himself a sinner deserving damnation, and he pleads that God in mercy, his mercy and his alone, would save him. I think the Bible does indicate this, that if you will thus desperately, patiently, perseveringly, undiscouragingly wait upon God, he probably will convert you. And this I close. Suppose you do find it in your heart to believe. Suppose you do know that Jesus Christ is to you not someone without comeliness from whom you would turn your faces but the fairest among 10,000, the bright and morning star. Suppose you can say where you sit, not just sentimentally because it's good to say this, or because it gives you a smug sense of complacency, but honestly, I love Jesus. Not just the name, but I love everything he stands for. The severity of his commandments, the uncompromising lordship which he holds over us, the exacting requirements he lays upon us, the perfect obedience he requires of us. I love Jesus. I love everything he says, everything he is, and everything he stands for. I believe. And when he says, come unto me, I know I come to him. I'm not fleeing from hell. I'm fleeing to Jesus. I am scared of hell, yes. But I am not coming to Jesus because I'm afraid of hell. You can put the fires of hell out if you please. You can blast it off the face of the universe if you wish. You can prove to me there is no hell. I don't care. I love Jesus and I want Jesus. If you find that in your heart, dear friend, then remember what our Savior has said here to Nicodemus. You have been born from above. The Spirit of God has wrought grace in your soul. And as he said to his disciples of long ago, he says to you, Blessed are ye, and rejoice that your names have been written in the book of life. He has not appointed you to damnation or to wrath, as the scripture says in Thessalonians, but to life. My sheep hear my voice. You hear his voice? That means you're his sheep. If you believe in him now, it's because God is bringing you to him. No man cometh unto, the, unto me except the Father draw him, and you're coming to him, so the Father's drawing you. He's saying to you, as he said to Peter, Blessed art thou, flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And someday, at that last judgment, when you take your place with the sheep on his right hand, you'll hear Jesus Christ saying, Come, ye blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So, dear friends, if you would escape the judgment, wait desperately upon God. And if you find it in your heart now to believe in Jesus, believe in him and rejoice not only that you have escaped from hell, but that you have been brought into eternal life. Let us pray. O oh, our Father in heaven, 
Thou art God, and there is none beside thee. Thou hast spoken to us in these last days in thy dear Son, and thou hast given to us thy written word for the permanent instruction of thy people. Thou hast set us between evil and garrison. We are in the valley of decision. O oh God, our God, bring this solemnity and the cruciality of this moment, these days of our years, into the keen consciousness of everyone present, that we may not foolishly dance in the shadow of the gallows or make merry when our hearts are not at peace with God. But, O oh, teach us, we pray Thee, to apply our hearts to wisdom. We thank Thee that Thou art gracious, and that everyone who truly comes to Thee, Thou dost graciously receive, and that no one who sincerely desires Thee shall be cast out. But we acknowledge, O oh God, we do not have it in our hearts to come, nor do we of ourselves sincerely love Thee. But Thou alone, O Spirit of God, can work this change in us will make us, which will make us love the God whom we now disobey. O blessed Spirit, descend upon us, we pray Thee, in mighty power, in convicting, and in converting, and in sanctifying power, that we may wait upon Thee, that we may rejoice in Thee, and that we may make our way not to eternal death, but to everlasting life. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us this week at the Saybrook Meeting House. We hope you've been blessed by today's podcast. Saybrook Ministries' mission is to provide didactic and devotional content from the Christian faith delivered to the saints, recovered and refined by the Protestant Reformation. Be sure to visit saybrookministries.org for continually updated Christian content designed to inspire and invigorate our imagination and intellect. Join us next week for another journey to the Saybrook Meeting House. Until then, may God bless you.